100% of the world's population will be able to be classed with having some serious mental disorder. Serious enough that they, using their medical powers, could take anyone they like and lock them up in a psychiatry institution, in a psych institution, in a psych ward. That is the reality of this star chamber of people who have no right whatsoever other than an absence of organised protest to bring this into light. So this is what is coming down the hill. This is the new inquisition that they're bringing down. Now I've said fear, <laughs> and here I've raised this, which might make a number of people fearful. I'm not saying it to make it fearful. I'm merely reflecting a reality of what they are thinking, a, a part of them are thinking, and they are processing few, uh, it through. And the courts are more than happy to defer to this group to use their labels, which have no legal basis, moral basis, uh, research basis whatsoever, as the argument to disarm anyone who stands up for their rights. In fact, if you stand up for your rights, you are suffering a severe mental illness of disassociative disorder, and uh, they have every right under these claims, under DSM-4, to order a psych eval, and that's what they're doing. Now, if you want the website, it's www.dsm5.org. That's dsm5.org. I suggest you go and have a look to see what they're planning. Well, I mean, this is very relevant for us because I have a great respect for anyone that seeks to study knowledge, and, and so I have a great respect for people who want to study law or they want to study psychology. But psychology has nothing to do with the mind. Absolutely nothing. And they say it. Psychology is a study of inference through behavior. And what I mean by inference through behavior, it is making assumptions by virtue of what you do to then ascribe some classification of whether that is a, an illness or whether it is a, a normal or whether they can uh, force you to take some drug, or whether they can order some behavioural change. It is mind control. I'm sorry, it is nothing more than mind control. And if you want to know the truth, because the truth is, is absolutely in plain sight, go back to the founder, Sigmund Freud. He designed a system so he could take advantage of young women. I mean, ultimately, that's what Sigmund Freud did. He developed a mind control system for his own personal benefit that's how absurd and corrupt the system is and yet it has been allowed to continue and now of course becomes a key weapon for the future for them so how do we deal with this and, and what is the importance well fear ignorance risk and danger are things that we are facing uh, in our own emotions but we're also facing them within the courts and in the tools that we're developing with Eucadia and we're developing with One Heaven we are trying to draw a line with foundations that will stand the test of time I, I know people need remedy and so I get a lot of emails saying when will you update the documents on mortgages when will you update the documents on court what about the latest uh, focus that some great, great minds have put together in terms of making some of these processes more relevant to a particular place. And what I've been saying is, yes, that is crucial. We need to be more relevant. We need to have the updates. People need the tools. But more importantly, we need a foundation that absolutely can be relied upon to be here today, tomorrow, the next day, 50, 100 or longer years and that is the canons so what's been clear when we move into the second point tonight is that the canons have become 
and I'm very pleased they've become, but have become a source of reference, a place of learning, of learning the law, which is what, why they were developed, but also a confidence in the law. The number of times that we'll have a chance to get these right, I feel, is, is once. I don't feel that there's a chance that if we don't get it right today, that maybe in 50 or 100 years will be perfected then, <clears throat> simply because of the law of averages. How many times has anyone challenged the assumed authority of the existing system to its core in a fundamental way? I would suggest that uh, Martin Luther, 500 plus years ago, the history is pretty thin. So there is an updated version now as to the naming of the canons. It doesn't change the canons of divine law. It doesn't change the canons of natural law. It doesn't change the canons of positive law or ecclesiastical law beyond some of the updates that I shared with you last talk show, particularly with positive law, missing key elements of rhetoric and logic, the tools of argument, the tools of thinking, and ecclesiastical law, missing the key area of sacraments, the sacred rituals, the sacred procedures that underpin all administrative procedure in the public side. So those things don't change, but what is apparent because we speak of this over and over when we say mind, body, spirit. Is it divine being spirit, nature being body, mind as its own canons was absent. Now, originally it was planned in the design of these that the canons of mind would be addressed after I had developed administrative law. And to be perfectly honest, that really came about because I'm not the, I'm not the all infallible, infallible one. I'm learning and I take what knowledge comes to me through inspiration and research as it comes. And I was loathed to go back and <laughs> recorrect the order of these because it's a lot of work, uh, you know, hours and hours and hours of work. And the midst of moving and the midst of my own domestic issues and and uh, trying to scratch money together and, and just living and surviving I thought here we go more, more things to do and of course more things to do more time more frustration and and you become more frustrated because you're saying we've been promised these things when will they be finished why is this constant revision but then of course we're talking about things that are being happening in weeks and days and they've had decades and centuries. So I bit the bullet. I spoke to a number of you, and the feedback was unanimous. The order of canons must recognise that cognitive law is the third body of law. In a moment, I'm going to go through for the next half hour. I'm going to go through exactly what we mean by cognitive law, and I hope you will see the significance of it. But I'm going to read to you the order of canons as it now stands in light of the importance of bringing cognitive law forward. I want to share this with you before we get in. So I want you to get a feel for how this is actually strengthening by biting the bullet and making sure this is absolutely as strong as it can be. So the first book of canon law remains divine law. And it holds true. The divine law stands true. The second book of, uh, of canon law remains natural law. Again, that relationship in those two books and the canons within them are extremely strong. The third book now is no longer positive law, but cognitive law. Now, I'm going to go into the detail of cognitive law, but let me define what I mean by cognitive law now, and then we'll get into the detail later. What I mean by cognitive law is cognitive law is derived from the simultaneous application of divine law and natural law. All valid cognitive law may be defined as part divine and part natural. Hence, supernatural. 
So the mind sits midstream between divine and natural. And if you want uh, a, a, an analogy, an image, let's say divine is white, nature is black. Just for argument's sake, let's say divine is white, nature is black, then mind and cognitive law would be an infinite array of greys in between. That's the, that's the magic of cognitive law. That's the magic of mind. So cognitive law is the third. That means that positive law becomes the fourth book of canon law now. Ecclesiastical law becomes the fifth book. Then from that connects through to administrative law. Then after administrative law, we're now looking at the canons of urban law. And the reason that urban law, and by urban we mean the development of cities, towns, villages, homes, communities, infrastructure, transport, the way we live. And the reason that the canons of the way we live is brought forward is that the way we live determines so many of the other things we deal with. If they divide, divide and design a city where we have to travel 10 miles a day to work, then that means we can't mind our children. We have to give our children to someone else. And that's a deliberate design. That's not a normal historical design because people didn't give up their children to someone else during the day and take that for normal, take that for granted. Instead, villages were designed so that after you'd done some work, you could go in and actually see your children have lunch with your children, then return back to the fields or wherever you were working. But in the urbanisation, quote-unquote, and the development of the car, they separated industry and light industry and craft and put it in its own area, put living in another area, put schools in another area, put administration in another area, so that the city was spread out, divided. And they argued that that was economically rational. But of course, it was very deliberately designed. It was about breaking down the family unit, breaking down the social unit, keeping us separated, dividing and conquering. So urban law plays a crucial part. That's why it's brought up. Now, if you've gone to sites like America's Union or Asia Union or Oceanic Union, you'll see that we've developed a number of codes of law like civil code and criminal code. But really from that, uh, what is the civil code, the civil law? It is the law of contracts. It is the law of agreement. It is the law of inheritance. It's the law of succession. So the, the next body of law after urban law is civil law, really to bring that out. Then after that, after civil law, the next part of canons is monetary, which is dealing with the rules of money. Now, on the rules of money, and I'm not going to spend too much time on this because this will be subject of other calls, but the, the single reason that we haven't moved forward on the and turning on the monetary system yet is it's not about personal wealth. I wish it was because I need, I need money, but it's not about personal wealth. It's not even about the wealth of ourselves. It's about recognizing the essence, the absolute essence of what makes money work, why has it broken down, and how to develop a system that when it is turned on, it can't be corrupted or destroyed. There's no point building a safe harbor for the existing pirates of commerce. It's about building something that is going to sustain us into the future. And the monetary canons are crucial. So after that is then financial. And by financial, we don't simply mean uh, accounting. In financial, we mean the concept that I've raised before called ekelos, E-K-E-L-O-S, ekelos, as opposed to economics. Economics being a form of control that is a brother or sister to psychology. Then after that, technology, and then I'll whip through.